The world that we live in, it's a beautiful place, am I right? Filled with wonders, beautiful sights, such as the Yosemite Valley, LA Sprawl, everything in California basically, and yeah, the rest of the wonders that exist in the world too. Now think of what enables us to see this world. Have you thought of the underlying processes that allow us to perceive this world that we live in? Sensation and perception should ring a bell to all of you AP psychers out there. Without these underlying processes, the world that we lived in would not be or mean anything to us. Sensation. The process by which our sensory receptors and nervous system receive and represent stimulus energies from our environment. Perception, on the other hand, is the process of organizing and interpreting sensory information, enabling us to recognize meaningful objects and events. In a way, sensation and perception resembles the difference between the base and premium package that come with different car models. Sensation is much like the base package. It comes without any of the luxuries that, aka in this example, of perception, that make up the premium package, such as the navigation systems, backup camera, etc. Sensation is just the process by which our sensory receptors are stimulated, just one half of the whole process. Meanwhile, perception is the premium package, as it comes with everything and ultimately enables us to organize and make sense of the stimulation of our sensory receptors. It's an absolute threshold. A major concept in terms of sensation is the minimum stimulation needed to detect a particular stimulus 50% of the time. So for example, this chord on the guitar. Despite how quiet it is, you're still, still able to hear it, which comes to show that your absolute threshold was still able to detect the chord played, whereas if I were to barely strum the strings, the combined sounds that make up the chord would fall below your absolute threshold. Though it is not a good example for our next concept, it does somewhat display subliminal stimulation. Subliminal stimulation is any stimulation that lies below our absolute thresholds. For example, those videos on YouTube that display subliminal messages in Disney movies, such as the message seen in, in this clip. Upon first glance, the message fell below our absolute threshold until the message was pointed out. So even if we think our sensory abilities are strong, there are always going to be stimulation or something that falls below our absolute threshold. Another major concept in re regards to sensation is sensory adaptation. When we're around a certain stimulus for a long enough time, that you begin to ignore it. For example, if you were to go swimming in a cold pool, the sensory receptors on your skin would heavily be stimulated by the cold water, but after being in the water for several minutes, your body would eventually adapt to the stim stimuli presented through the cold water and in turn allow you to enjoy the pool. Our sensory abilities come in five different forms, vision, hearing, touch, taste, and olfaction, along with our vestibular and kinesthetic sense. Little of the visual spectrum eyes can see. The eye is composed of the cornea, which is a clear protective covering over the eye. Behind the cornea lies the sclera, or the white part of the eye. On the sclera is the iris, which is a pigmented muscle that adjusts the pupil size. The pupil is a hole in your eye that allows light to enter the eye. Behind the pupil is your lens, which changes its structure to focus incoming rays of light onto the back of the eye, which is light sensitive and called the retina. The retina is made up of photoreceptors called rods and cones. Rods help us to see light, while cones help us to see light and detail. In terms of hearing, pitch is much like what wavelength is to seeing. It is defined as a tones, experience highness or lowness. Clearly our two ears are what enable us to hear, but more importantly it is the transduction which is defined as the conversion of sensory energy into neural impulses that takes place within the cochlea that enables us to sense what it is that we are hearing. So slightly different messages sensed by the two ears let us know what direction certain sounds are coming from. Two major concepts in relation to hearing are place theory, which is defined as how we hear pitch depending on where the cochlear's membrane is stimulated, and frequency theory, the rate of nerve impulses traveling up the auditory nerve, match the frequency of the tone, thus enabling us to sense its pitch. Now in terms of touch. Our sense of touch is based on pressure, warmth, cold, and pain. The combination of these senses can produce different sensations, such as warmth and cold producing the sensation of heat, or pressure and cold producing a wet sensation. A major theory regards our sense of touch is the gate control theory, which states that our spinal cords have gates that open or close to transmit pain impulses. Small fibers open these gates, which is what allows us to feel pain, while large fibers close these gates, in turn providing relief from pain. Taste is one of the chemical senses that is composed of sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. We are able to taste through our taste buds, which re regenerate every one to two weeks. These receptors, along with the process of transduction, would allow us to taste God's gift of pizza, which fills our taste buds with joy and delight. 
Next is olfaction. Olfaction is another form of our chemical sense which transmits information from the nose to the temporal lobe. This is our only sense that is not transmitted directly to the thalamus. Chemical sense means whenever you smell something, little bits of it are in your nose. Our sense of smell is connected to the limbic system so that we can identify when we smell a familiar scent and in turn identify linking scents with specific memories. Smell goes in through the nasal passage to the olfactory bulb and then finally to the olfactory nerve. And the last concept revolving around our sensation deals with our sixth sense, which is fundamental to our other senses and our survival. The two major concepts are kinesthesis and vestibular sense. Kinesthesis is the system for sensing the position and movement of, of individual body parts. Our kinesthesis is what, is what allows us to be able to sense the position of our limbs in the dark. Thus, whether we be in, a, in light or a complete darkness, our kinesthesis is what allows us to locate our limbs and not trip out if we cannot see them. Vestibular sense is defined as the sense of body movement and position, including the sense of balance. This sense is based on the fluids in our vestibular sacs that are located in the semicircular canals, which move when the head moves. This in turn stimulates hair-like cell receptors in the inner ear, which then sends signals to the cerebellum, allowing us to become balanced. Now on to perception. Selective attention is defined at any moment we focus our awareness on a limited source of stimulus. Thus, I can focus my attention on the camera right in front of me while we're filming this. You know, bang, bang. <laughs> Next, the cocktail party effect is defined as being able to focus on what one person is saying in a room full of talking people. Such as if we were at a party with loud music playing, various conversations going on, and other noises, I would still be able to focus on the conversation with the person next to me. How they have like the little drawing on it? It looks exactly like that I started out. From Chipotle? Yeah. See, I don't go to Chipotle. Why not? I don't find it. There are several different concepts that are important to perceptual organization. First is perceptual illusions, which are defined as illusions that construct or stimuli so we misinterpret the information being given. For example, this image right here, which produces the illusion of what appears to be an angry elderly couple gazing at each other, when in reality it is two men sitting next to each other under a golden chalice. Other minute factors play a role in making up this illusion, but in all, each factor contributes to the painting's illusion. <laughs> Next is Gestalt, in order, or, which is defined as an organized whole, which emphasizes our tendency to integrate pieces of information into meaningful wholes. Our ability to form visual perceptions is based on the processes of figure ground, perception grouping, depth perception, monocular cues, and binocular cues. Figure ground is defined as how we organize and distinguish an object or figure from surrounding stimuli. For example, in the case of looking at the famous vase image, we are able to distinguish the vase from the black background but also we are able to perceive the faces by distinguishing the background from the object of the image and in turn perceive the faces. Grouping is defined as our perceptual tendency to organize stimuli into coherent groups based on the stimuli's proximity, proximity, similarity, continuity, connectedness, and closure. For example, in terms of similarity, we can group an assorted package of marbles based on their similarity in their size and color. Depth perception is our ability to see objects in 3D, in turn allowing us to perceive shape and distance. For example, being able to gauge the distance of an oncoming car when waiting to complete a turn. So our ability to perceive depth in this case can either allow us to complete the turn or die. Monocular cues is defined as depth cues for one eye alone, such as inner position or linear perspective. This can include factors such as relative size, interposition, relative clarity, texture radiance, relative height, and relative motion. Other cues are defined as depth cues from one eye alone. This can include factors such as relative size, interposition, relative clarity, texture radiance, relative height, relative motion, linear perspective, and light and shadow. For example, in terms of relative motion while riding in a train, we, fix our, we fixate our attention on a tree in the distance. The farther the objects are away from the tree, the slower they seem to move, and the closer they are, the faster they move. <coughs> Binocular cues are defined as depth cues that depend on the use of two eyes. This includes retinal disparity and convergence. For example, our binocular cues of retinal disparity is the way in which our right and left eye view two different images. So if we were to alternate the eye looking down at our nose, each eye would see a different image. The visual cliff is a major concept in relation to depth perception. The visual cliff was devised by Eleanor Gibson and Richard Walk to test the depth perception of infants. 
The younger the infant, the more likely they were to go over the cliff. But as they got older, they became wary of falling and would not go past the table, thus signaling their ability to perceive death. Now let's move on to motion perception. Let's take a look at the five phenomena, which is defined as an illusion of movement created when two or more adjacent lights blink on and off in succession. It's like when you're at a carnival and lights have a stand turn on in succession, and it looks like the light is moving through them all, but it's actually just light bulbs turning off and on at the right time. Now let's move on to perceptual adaptation. When dealing with vision, it is the ability to adjust to an artificially displaced or inverted visual field. In other words, if you wore a pair of glasses that literally turned the world upside down, According to perceptual adaptation, you would eventually be able to adjust and see things right side up again. For example, the goggles that Harley here is wearing, created by George Stratton, created, who created goggles where it flips the relevant image to be upside down. Now on the context effects. Our schemas that are pre-existing affect how we perceive an image. However, context clues can influence this as well. If someone were to say, Ump is a terrible presidential candidate as well as a human being, one would use context clues to assume whoever is talking is referring to Donald Trump. Now on ESP, which, or if you want to extend out, you know, extrasensory perception, is another idea of perception where we can perceive things from inputs other than activation of our sensory receptors. However, after thousands of experiments, no one has ever been able to prove that ESP does in fact exist. Magician James Randi even offered money for anyone that could prove the existence of ESP. And that is all for today's Crash Course episode on sensation and perception. Catch you next time or more so the next group's video on stages of consciousness. And I hope if you have watched this that it helps contribute to the ultimate cause of this class. Passing the AP exam. Toodaloo.